uh, we've got some prepared questions we've got some questions that came through when you book to come um, and I'm sure there'll also be questions in the chat um, I don't think we'll be able to answer them all in just an hour um, but we will try and cover as many different uh, sides of the curatorial coin as possible uh, so to start our session off um, I'd like uh, each of our panellists uh, to introduce themselves, uh, tell us where they work and describe how they approach uh, curation in three words. Um, and I'm going to pick on Adam to start us off because he's at the top of my screen. Hey, okay, well, hello everyone. Uh, my name's Adam and I'm the curator for World Cultures at Leeds Museums and Galleries. Um, so my job is to look after collections from Africa, Asia, Oceania and the Americas. Um, so uh, I've been at Leeds for a couple of years now. Um, the three words I'd say would describe the way I approach curating is accessible, collaborative and conventional. I think I'm a fairly conventional um, curator. I don't take many risks. Uh, and that's maybe something I should work on. Fantastic, Adam. Thank you. Um, Adam and I work together, um, so it's lovely to hear his insight um, as well. Um, Melissa, how about you? Hi, everyone. My name is Melissa, um, and I'm currently sort of splitting my time between two roles. So half of the week I work in um, government for the Greater London Authority on sort of community engagement projects um, that I've managed to kind of weasel my past museum experience into. Um, and I can talk a bit about that later. And my other half of the week is spent at the National Trust working on a big research project um, on their photography collections. Amazing. Oh, that sounds sorry, so I didn't give my oh. three words. <laughs> so um, they'd probably be collaboration, research, and ooh, uh, community, probably. That's lovely. Um, Holly, how about you? Hi everyone, um, I'm Holly, I'm the curator at Nessum, which is the National Emergency Services Museum and we're based in Sheffield. Loads of people won't know who we are because uh, we're a small independent, um, entirely self-funded, which is rare to see. Um, and we have a collection that spans uh, well, from the 17th century uh, onwards and we cover uh, all aspects of the emergency services um, and the surrounding sort of uh, society that they impact, so it's quite broad. Um, I've been in this position for about three years uh, and it's a bit of an odd one, but I think my approach to curation will be uh, probably accessible, creative and sustainable, I think. I think that's most apt at the moment anyway. Uh, no one's beholden to the, the three words that you give. They can change across time, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> uh, and Stacey, please tell us about yourself um, and your three words. Hello everyone, nice to meet you all. Um, my name is Stacey Ann Bagdy and I am currently the Collections and Exhibitions Officer with Curator in Brackets um, at Headstone Manor Museum and that's a local authority museum based in the London Borough of Harrow. Um, I've been there since last July actually um, so it feels quite quite a long time. Um, my three words to describe my approach would be uh, collaborative, transparent and relevant. Thanks so much, Stacey. Um, I'm writing down these words as you're talking because it's always good to get inspiration for myself. Uh, so uh, one of the questions that I'd like to start us off with um, in terms of your uh, kind of career and how you uh, approached it, uh, what, what came first, wanting to be a curator um, or the, the objects or the collection interest that you currently curate? Um, and again, Adam, would you mind starting us off with that one? Uh, okay, so I'd say for me, it was definitely the um, cultures and the collections that I was interested in first. Um, I, I did visit museums when I was younger, but I don't, I, you know, certainly when I was a teenager, I didn't go to museums um, religiously. Um, but I studied anthropology at university. So in anthropology, you study lots of different cultures and you compare them and con contrast them. Um, so it was definitely an interest in other cultures that came first. I would say 
I certainly wasn't interested in objects. I didn't really think about artifacts or objects much when, even when I was studying. I think there was one module on what they called material culture, but it was mostly how people live, uh, people's food, people's religion, uh, people's gender relations, people's economy, things like that, that I was more interested in. And certainly the, the, it dawned on me in my early 20s that you could use museums to explore those things through objects. Um, but yeah, certainly I, I probably didn't know what a curator was in my, certainly when I was a teenager, whereas some people obviously they're very well aware of it. Thanks, Adam. Uh, how about you, Holly? Um, what was your kind of uh, approach on that? Yeah, um, bit of an odd one, I suppose. My um, the collection I work with um, it never dawned on me to to work with anything. I mean, fire engines and that kind of thing. It's great, but it was not a thing I set out to do. Um, but I don't think I could say with any certainty that I ever said. I wanted to set out to be a curator because when I was starting out um, my understanding of what a curator was was minimal and it was the stereotype um, that I won't go into yet in fear of offending people <laughs> uh, you know that archetypal um, sort of tweed obsessive um, and to me that was not what I set out to do but I knew I wanted to curate experiences and I knew I wanted object centric um, experiences and in that sort of uh, vein I suppose I did want to be a curator um, but it was um, an, odd, an odd route to get there so it definitely wasn't for me it wasn't sort of based on the collections or the objects themselves at first um, now it's totally different um, my objects are my children <laughs> so um, a love for my topic has come from that but initially it probably was um, a desire to curate experiences and, and object centric stuff yeah that's, uh, yeah, so great to hear. Um, I'm really interested, and I hope our audience is as well, um, on getting a sense of the kinds of projects that people work on um, in their daily life. Um, and Stacey, I wondered if you could uh, tell us about one project that you've worked on uh, that you're really proud of. Yeah, sure. Um, I think I'll draw upon uh, quite a recent project I've just worked on. Um, so recently we sought out funding from the London Museum Development Fund, who are currently running a Diversity Matters programme. I think they might be in their third year now. Um, but the grant is for £1,000 to develop a project and an exhibition that uh, basically aims to diversify your collections that are relevant to your communities that, that you serve. So previously at the museum I'm currently out, you know, we haven't really held a single exhibition or, or done such a project on this kind of scale that solely focuses on it, you know, a diverse aspect. And, it, it, you know, I saw this as a real opportunity for us to kind of challenge ourselves as a museum and also um, my own practice. Um, I haven't really written a grant before this so that was quite a challenge for me and um, you know it might be a thousand pounds but a thousand pounds we didn't have before and you know for the, the outputs and the value that we gained from it um, you know overpowers that, that monetary value and we were successful at gaining that grant and um, we basically delivered the project over the last couple of months. Uh, the exhibition and the project was around Diwali in Haro and uh, the communities that celebrate Diwali. So it kind of opened my eyes up to actually what Diwali is, even though I do celebrate it personally. I don't think I was fully aware of the in and out of Diwali. And um, we were really close to actually installing the exhibition well in advance of the actual date before a lockdown was announced. So we had to close that. So whilst we were a bit disappointed that exhibition didn't happen, we did curate um, some online content featuring all the objects and the stories that we collected. Um, some of the elements were virtual anyway, we kind of planned for that. So we, on our page, we have a free downloadable community recipe book, um, some YouTube videos and some all, all sorts of downloadable activities. Um, so yeah, the project was successful. I was quite proud of it because like I said, it was a challenge for us. We interacted with over you know, 30 different people than we, we hadn't interacted with before. Most of those people hadn't even heard of us or hadn't even, you know, they definitely lived down the road and they hadn't even visited the museum before. So for me, that was a massive success that I was proud of. 
uh, we collected new objects for the collection uh, you know like I said we don't have a diverse collection at the moment so that that was pretty impressive and um, yeah looking forward to hopefully doing the exhibition in February next year so that's one of the most recent projects I'd say I was proud of. Uh, that's amazing. Um, my heart sings at the idea of people who live down the road coming through the doors for the first time. Uh, and I think everybody's, um, everybody here will, will uh, appreciate that. Um, Melissa, uh, would you be able to talk to us about a project that you've worked on and that you feel proud of as well? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I think the one that I would mention would be um, the Careers of Sierra Leone display that I co-created um, when I was still at Museum of London um, with so sort of Sierra, Sierra Leone and um, Creo Community um, Organisation um, and that's still on display now because it keeps getting extended because the museum keeps getting closed essentially so that was supposed to come down in September but now it's up until March so um, you should have plenty of time to see it and I'll share some links to some of the online content but um, I really enjoyed working on that I think um, because I really enjoyed working with Yemide who was the, the external co-curator and we kind of did everything from the beginning together. So she, she went through the whole sort of bureaucratic museum process of like putting in the bid for the exhibition, all of the uh, selecting the objects, writing the text, being at all the design meetings and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and it was, I think it was just really good to have someone on the outside who was like um, really passionate about it and all, almost kind of the critical friend built into the project because obviously how um, her history was portrayed was really, really important to her. And sort of, I guess there's, you get more satisfaction in getting something right if you're working with that group and, and they really appreciate it. And because of her involvement, um, we were able to do loads of really amazing outreach stuff. So we had lots of community events where um, sort of 70, 80 um, Sierra Leone and Creole people came to the museum um, in like full national, costume um, and we had sort of the mayor of Freetown came and did a tour for Sierra Leone Londoners of, of the exhibition and spoke to them about sort of issues that were close to them um, and we've had sort of other sort of events connected to that um, so it's been really really good to, I guess to have that community involvement in in the project from the beginning and for the community to really embrace the project and sort of seeing on the Facebook group that she shares with me when people come over from like the US or from other parts of West Africa and like, oh, we really enjoyed it and like posting pictures of them and their families there. Um, that's just been, I guess, the best part of doing it. Um, so that's probably the project that I've, I'm most proud of so far. Uh, that sounds incredible. Um, I, I'm proud of it to hear about it. it sounds amazing. Um, in a couple of um, people's discussion points, you talked on this idea of co-curation. Um, and I wanted to uh, discuss that a bit more in this session because it's uh, a ter terminology that comes up quite a lot uh, in the museum sector, rightly so. Um, and I wanted to ask um, people um, how important it is to your work um, and kind of where does the responsibility lie for it in your organisation? Um, and I guess kind of allied as well um, is uh, if you're not working as a curator at the moment, how can you get experience? Um, in thinking about co-curating things. Um, and I'm gonna go for Adam again, um, if that's all right. Of course, yeah. Um, okay, so I would say um, in the work we do in Leeds, it's it's very important. In, in Leeds, we have a curatorial team and a communities team. Um, whereas in other museums, they you might have a curator who just who does all of that work. Um, but in Leeds, we, as a curator, I'm expected to work with the communities team and not just kind of shut myself off um, with the objects. So um, it's, it's, it's very important what we do. It's written into our collecting policy. It's written into our kind of um, forward plan. Um, although having said that, I've worked on two exhibitions while I've been in Leeds. One of them was co-curated um, sort of 50-50 with the community. So that was a project on migration. Um, so that involved a community panel making decisions about um, how you structure the exhibition, what kind of stories you tell, helping us source objects, um, uh, those kind of things. You kind of approach to the exhibition. Um, but then another exhibition which I worked on recently um, on Japan, that, that was hardly co-curated. There wasn't a sort of pressure for me to 
co-curate it. Um, I mean, that's partly because the community in Japanese community in Leeds is quite small. Um, so I'd say it's important, but I would say it's not it's not kind of vital to every project you do. Um, sometimes the narrative lends itself or the subject matter lends itself to working with communities and other times it doesn't. Um, also, if you have communities who are far away, um, so if you're dealing with cultures that aren't represented in the demographics of the city that you work in, it's sometimes quite hard to do that. Um, although now maybe we're all getting used to working online a bit more, maybe it's a bit easier, but certainly working with sort of indigenous source communities and things like that, you do need to put resources in um, to either be able to travel to the, those countries or, or have a kind of online infrastructure to get those communities to to uh, co-curate with you. So I'd say it, you know, it, with some projects it's important, with, with others it's, it's emphasised a bit less. Thanks very much, Adam. Uh, and Stacey, could I ask you to talk a little bit about co-curation in your role as well? Yeah, I actually forgot to mention, I do apologise, but the Diwali exhibition and the project we ran um, was co-created with a mental health charity who are called Mental Wealth. They focus on South Asian um, mental health in Hao. And I think maybe I'm a bit different to Adam in, the, in some cases because we are very much a local history museum and it is just myself in the collections team. <laughs> um, Co-creation for me is kind of the highest priority and I do implement it within ev every project and every exhibition I, I do curate. Um, so, for example, you know, next year I have planned every exhibition with a co-curated element. I mean, it just kind of helps me, you know, to to do that because we are there for the communities and, and it's, you know, very much in our interest to be um, a co-creative practice. And, you know, we do have to report on a cultural strategy within the council and part of that does involve working with a lot of different communities. Um, so yeah, like next year, we, for example, we have like a nature exhibition and we're working alongside the Nature History Society, a women's exhibition with the Women's History Group and another South Asian exhibition on resilience. So yeah, I would say yeah. for me, it's the highest priority. Uh, oh, sorry, I can hear a bit of feedback. Uh, but they, they do dictate everything from the, the panels, the labels, to the, to the actual display. So yeah, I think for me, the, the position of a curator is changing. I think um, in, a, in a smaller institute, we're very much with a facilitator of stories. And, and I'm, yeah, I'm not sure that applies to everyone, but that, that's how it is for me. Thanks so much, Stacey. I love that phrase, facilitator of stories. Um, I wondered, Holly, if you could, because you're working in a similar sized organisation, talk about how co-curation works for you as well. Yeah, so I, I totally um, agree with uh, what Stacey was saying. And it, it's, it's very different um, when you work in a small museum, because uh, like Stacey, I am <laughs> pretty much the collections uh, and curatorial team. So um, I, I have a team of volunteers that help. Um, but for, for us, um, co-curation is is essential. Um, when there is such a small internal team, it is only natural for you to reach out to external partners to create projects um, in a sort of cooperative manner. And I think for me in particular, um, every day that has got, got that sort of uh, communal aspect to it, whether it's internally across departments um, or whether it's external, uh, we do a lot of work with um, artists and especially the emergency services. So um, there's always that that aspect there underlying, um, even in a lot of our permanent um, galleries. So even in some of the permanent galleries, there'll be a facet of that which is um, changeable and, and co-curated. So um, it is, for me personally, it's the only way I can work in the organisation that I work in. Um, I think if somebody said you couldn't work like that, then then we'd we'd be lost. Um, it's the only way, uh, really, to sort of get through the quagmire of everything. Um, and it is relevant to us because we're quite a grassroots organisation. And with our subject matter, obviously, there's these um, the emergency services are there, wanting and willing to uh, work on on projects with us. So it would be daft uh, not to. Uh, reach out to them and uh, help them on, on community engagement aspects in particular. Um, so yeah, it is essential. Uh, sometimes the pressure can be quite mounting uh, as a sort of grassroots 
organization you feel like you have to take absolutely everybody's feedback on board and you have to include everybody and that can be difficult uh, especially when we're talking about physicality because our site is quite uh, restrictive we're in a victorian uh, fire police and ambulance station uh, so it doesn't you know lend itself well to uh, certain projects so you, you you have to be conscious that there is only so much you can do um, and I assume uh, Stacey will relate to this, but when you're sort of solo in this position, um, the pressure can become quite intense uh, and you just have to sort of say to yourself that you can only sort of do so much, um, but it is helpful to reach out to those communities who are, are happy to work on things with you. Thanks so much, Holly. That's, uh, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always so amazing to hear other people talk about their practice. Um, we're going to just move on slightly to some of the questions that are more about how, what route um, uh, we all, all took to get into these curatorial roles, um, or if we are kind of still in them indeed. Um, and uh, the first question I think is for Melissa, um, and kind of like what, because your path has been slightly different, so kind of how did you get to the point where you were co-curating with the Sierra Leonean communities uh, in London? Um, yeah, well, I don't think my, my story is a typical one, but um, I think, I, and I don't like to say it this way because it's really unhelpful for everybody, but I think there were like a number of like quite lucky for me coincidences in, um, in my path to, to getting where I got to. And I think Luck, I think the first one was that I was volunteering at Museum of London Docklands um, whilst I was finishing my PhD and by virtue of being a volunteer I had access to internal recruitment and that's basically how I got my my job in the museum. Had I not been a volunteer there I would never have seen that post because it would not have gone out externally. So as I happen to be in that post and my background is in sort of history of the Caribbean, history of empire, um, and you know with some expertise around history of enslavement that was something that uh, expertise that was quite thin in the museum at that time so my actual role at the museum of london wasn't a curatorial role at all i worked um, in research engagement um, with university students and um, university researchers i managed the phd program um, at the museum but because there wasn't someone who had that kind of depth of knowledge I ended up having to do like quite a lot of extra things <clears throat> related to the sugar and slavery gallery at the museum um, and the first thing was this kind of community forum that I did back in 2017 um, that I co-created with someone um, external um, because we just needed to put they need the museum needed to put some resource onto that project and they, they put me onto it essentially um, and from that I guess that's where my involvement with that gallery started and when this proposal from a community group came to work on a temporary display for that gallery um, and also because there was lots of well, most of the other curators were working on the new museum project which you probably know of so that the museum of london is, is going to move in a couple of years and it's it's taking a lot of resource to kind of think of what the new galleries will look like so because of all of those things i ended up being the person who was um put forward to, to work on this um co-curation project um, so I think something that's really important is that um, you value your expertise and you value um, sort of what you can bring, even if it's even if it's not necessarily um, your job. Um, so if you are in a, in a collections management role, or if you're in a learning team role, or if you're in I don't know volunteer management, but you have an, you have a knowledge that other people in your organisation don't have, and it becomes relevant. I definitely say to speak to speak out about that and to kind of to demonstrate um, your, what you're able to do. Um, and I think that was quite important for me in, in being able to do that project. Um, but obviously, you know, as, as well, I know in museums, a lot of people are already quite overcommitted um, in their jobs. A lot of museums are under-resourced, so you might already be working one and a half or two people's jobs in your time. That's definitely what I was doing. So I guess it's about kind of being careful when you take on opportunities, but definitely not being afraid to speak up and, and to volunteer yourself um, and to have those discussions with your manager about maybe spending sort of a day of your week on something that's more of a passion project or, or something that you're more interested in um, if, if those kinds of opportunities arise. Um, because what can you lose? They can only say no. 
and you didn't have it to begin with, right? So if, if they say, no, you haven't really lost anything, um, but you've taken that chance. Absolutely. I totally agree with taking chances and putting yourself forward. Uh, we all have like such amazing talents. Um, we just need to make sure we make sure everyone else knows about them. Um, in terms of kind of other routes into getting into a curatorial role, um, Holly, would you be able to tell us a bit about your route? Uh, yeah, so mine was equally unusual. Um, and I think what can be difficult is is when you go down that route is um, there isn't, obviously there's nothing there in terms of support network. So you do feel a bit like you're floundering around. Um, but for me, I, um, I, I've i only got a BA, oh God. Uh, <laughs> and I don't have a master's and I don't have a PhD. Um, so anybody out there that's wondering, can it be done? yes it can um it's you know for me it all happened very unconventionally so um my idea was never to get um stuck in sounds awful because i love my job and i love my museum but i never intended to be so embedded um the idea was uh, to get um, a paid museum job uh, because you know for a lot of us that is just that's all we're aiming for to start with um, and then after that I was just going to explore different avenues of um, museum work just to get an idea of what it was I wanted to go into and then I was going to go back to uni and um, carry on with my masters and, and that was the plan um, but it didn't go to plan <laughs> um, I got a paid role in, in where I'm based now um, at Nessum and um, one thing led to another and uh, like Melissa said, uh, the skill set was there and some uh, experience. And because it was a self-funded independent, uh, small museums are an absolute uh, minefield, uh, really, when it comes to this kind of stuff, because um, you've got to be very cautious of them taking advantage. Um, but I sort of offered uh, certain um, expertise, I suppose, and, and experience, and I gave that freely. Um, it could have gone very wrong, but it didn't. Um, my predecessor, actually um, stepped down in sort of unconventional circumstances and I'd actually been helping him um, on various projects um, making his collection or his collection the collection accessible um, but um, with, with one thing or another that was not exactly the avenue he wanted to go down let's say um, so when he left I ended up I suppose accidentally taking on a lot of his uh, workload and then with one thing or another, um, I was delivering projects um, under a different job title um, that, that, that were curatorial. Uh, and eventually I assumed that role. Um, and I sort of hear what Melissa is saying is about, it's a lot of it's happy accidents. Um, and I get told off for saying that all the time because we're very much, I suppose it's, it's sort of um, a down thing to sort of say about yourself, oh, I just fell into this and this was just circumstantial and this was just accident, but actually, um, a lot of it is you've you've reached out there you've you've put feelers out and you've put the work in to get to where you are so I kind of totally agree with that because it does feel accidental for me um, every day I wake up and I'm like someone's gonna find out I shouldn't be in this job um, and um, really realistically every day you're doing it well you're doing the best you can and I think that's all people ask of you um, but yeah it was a very unconventional thing to get the way I you know to get to the job the way I got it but it was all basically based off of volunteering experience. Um, and that's something that's difficult for me because uh, a lot of people, uh, I actually met Lucy very sort of early on when I was exploring things. Uh, and she was um, absolutely fantastic at telling me sort of what avenues to go around and what to try and what not to try. And I, and I tried volunteering uh, and I volunteered every hour under the sun that I could. Um, but I'm from a working class background. Um, you know, I, I didn't have, massive pockets so I was um, going to university I had several jobs and then I was volunteering as well and I was working on maybe three or four projects at once um, and I was working really really late and whilst I, I advocate that totally because it's it's enabled me not to go through that academic route to get the job I want um, but at the same time I'm very much aware that it's not something everybody can do and I think if we're looking at this from going sort of off piece slightly if we're looking at it from um, a sector perspective it's so debilitating for people that that can't do that uh, the expectation that we can all give away our time for free um, to get there uh, is just not achievable I think if the options are get into more debt via university 
or sort of run yourself into the ground doing unpaid work um you know it's not exactly if anyone's out there looking to go into this line of work it's not exactly really appealing <laughs> so yeah yeah totally the reliance on taking advantage of people's unpaid labor is something that the sector should be ashamed of um i utterly agree um move i uh, i feel like i almost thought to pause after what you were saying uh, um holly because it was uh, so powerful um but in the meantime one of the questions that's come through which i think is really interesting um is uh do you have to have a kind of subject specialist expertise to be a curator uh or or does that matter less um and i wonder what you think about that stacy um i'm not sure i have the right answer um i don't think i mean it obviously depends on your passion it, i think if your passion for me my passion is egyptology um but that doesn't really serve me well in uh, a local history museum in in Howard. so i think at the end of the day expertise you know if that's your passion and you want to pursue that 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 you should definitely go for that but having an overall knowledge of, of history and a, and a passion for museums does uh, facilitate any curatorial role i think i don't know if anyone else has a bit of insight into that <laughs> no i love that i love that um i don't know uh, what you think adam i know you kind of said at the start uh, the subject sort of came from... um yeah i think I think you have to have a sort of top top level um, expertise. So it might be history or it might be art history or anthropology or um, say biological sciences. Um, but then within that, um, maybe more so for university museums, curators at university museums might have a, a specialism in say, you know, Fijian art or, you know, the art of India, you know, in the 1800s, something like that. Um, and that might be because they've done a, a PhD on it or because they've researched it kind of at undergraduate level. Um, so I'd say you kind of need a top level, you know, it's useful to have a kind of top level history or um, art history. Um, but then once you get into the, the subject matter itself, I think it's more important to be able to show that you can learn a, sub, a subject quickly. Um, so it could be that next year I'm asked to do an exhibition on a country that I don't know very much about um, because the, I curate a lot of countries um, and I don't know the history of every country that I have material from. Um, but feasibly, my employer could ask me to do an exhibition on a particular country, say Poland or I don't know, uh, you know, Indonesia. Um, and I would have to then jump headlong into reading every everything I can about that country, watching documentaries about them, talking to communities. Um, so I think it's important, it's certainly if you're having a job interview, to show that you can learn about something quickly, um, uh, rather than you know coming, coming to an interview and say, I know everything about every country and every historical period, because no one is in that situation. Um, but certainly show, giving an example of, something you've learned, uh, a subject matter you've learned in a short space of time, uh, it, it, yeah, is important. Yeah, I think uh, probably quite a lot of us maybe wing it a little bit more than we would like to with some of our museum knowledge. I do, confession. Um, we had um, a question that kind of links back to how we were talking about co-curation, but I'm going to kind of broaden it out a little bit. And it's how's your how does your time split up when you're working on a curatorial project? Like how much is uh, you know collections management? How much is liaising with community groups? And and how's that split up? And how does it change as well? Um, and I don't know whether you'd like to start us off with that, Melissa. I think it really depends on what museum you work at, honestly, because um, if you're working at sort of a big national museum and you're a curator, your role is very different um, from someone like Holly, um, who kind of, and also Stacey, who will have to do quite a lot of their own collect collections management. They might also have to sort of be on top of conservation and all that kind of stuff. Whereas at Museum of London, which is kind of not quite a national, but still a big museum, um, we have sort of a, collect a collections care team, we have a collections management team, 
we have a design team, we have exhibition project managers. So sort of the work that you, the work that you do as a curator is kind of part, when you're putting together an exhibition, for example, is very much part of a, a, a quite a big team. Um, whereas I can imagine if you're a smaller museum, um, that that's not the case. So I think you'll spend at, um, at Museum of London, there is kind of a lot of taking stock of the collections, knowing what's there, um, sort of thinking of ideas for displays, managing access to the managing access to the collections, dealing with inquiries about them. Um, but there's not so much of that kind of collections management, conservation, um, and you don't take on all of the work related to putting together an exhibition um, in the same way that you would at a smaller museum. I don't know, the people from smaller museums can probably <laughs> challenge me on that or say, or say something completely different, but that's how I, how, how I would perceive it to be, um, definitely. Uh, I don't know if you want to come in now, Stacey, uh, and talk a little bit about how your, your time divides. Yeah, I completely agree with what Melissa was saying. Um, I think you've summed up my job all uh, in, a, in a nutshell. I find it really difficult sometimes to manage our time. I think sometimes I get really annoyed if I'm sat at the desk all day, but that's because, you know, we deal with masses of collections. And um, for me, I manage both the museum and the archive collection. So you can amount, you know, you can kind of guess the amount of inquiries we have just from those alone and um, you know I don't really get to the store that often and then I also have to curate the exhibitions do pest management conservation and then you know next minute the doorbell's going and someone's <laughs> at the door with an object they want you to um, to tell everything about so yeah I think it's quite difficult to manage your time and uh, sometimes I do fall into the trap of trying to do so much um, anyway you know I have a sense of ideas sometimes and I kind of want to do them all at one one time so I, I definitely struggle with that um, I think I'll put my hands up to say to say that uh, and how about you Holly how does how does managing your time work um, thinking about what you were saying before as well yeah it's um, exactly what Stacey and, and Melissa said they were bang on there I think um, managing time is stressful uh, <laughs> I'm I'm fortunate to be full-time um, but in in my organization there's just two of us that are full-time and that's me and the chief exec um, so there is an awful lot of stuff to do in not enough time um, and uh, like Stacey said a lot of um, what Stacey uh, does is, is, is similar to me so collections management um, as well as sort of uh, exhibition content events curatorial general stuff um, but it is it, it, I think for me I I'm really good at like compartmentalizing um, and I, I don't know if Stacey will agree with this but you similar to what you were saying about um, desk work you can have a plan for the week um, and you, you, you're sorted, you know exactly what you're doing when um, and, and you, you're doing great and then something will happen, which means your, your whole sort of day planning, your whole week planning, if not your whole year planning, like her, <laughs> uh, has gone out of the window. So um, it is it's, it's difficult. And I think um, more and more in uh, today's sort of society, there's that whole concept of the 21st century curator. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that. I think they did um, the art fund did a report in 2017 uh, and I really resonate with everything they were saying because there's so much expected of us nowadays because they are diversifying the role um, and a lot of what um, may have been sort of six roles is now one um, and there's even more pressure regardless of whether you're in a small museum or a larger museum there's more pressure on one individual um, and I think in particular for me the thing I struggle with the most is sort of the pressure that the high stakes decisions um that you have to make without little, you know with little support um because in in my organization there is just sort of me so um there's that high level of expectation and i think a lot of people think curatorial roles are sort of they sound quite fun and you know for, for the best part they are but i think there is that there's a lack of awareness um at the moment of, of like uh, Lucy was saying earlier on of, of actually what we do and I think in smaller museums there is an enormous amount and not enough time to do that so I get around that by 
um, I, I've got a really um, great uh, volunteer program um, and we have um, an enormous sort of um, really amazing base of um, collections volunteers um, and I've sort of had them for, for about two and a half years and they've come through everything with me so everything I know they know um, and we've actually taken a few of them on and employed them in roles and stuff so and they've gone on to work in other museums so it's been a really good um, thing for them but at the same time it's really helped me um, sort of balance day-to-day uh, -day jobs really. That's fantastic to hear. Thanks, Holly. Um, what you were talking about, kind of decision making, it really resonates with another question that we've had come in, and it's about who decides what goes where, who decides what, who decides what goes in a permanent and what goes in a temporary display. Um, and a few of people have uh, asked that. So, if someone, if Adam, you could just talk us a little bit about the decision making uh, and uh, who has the power really um, in those choices. Um, well, I'd say maybe in an ideal world, it would it would it, say if you're doing a co-curated exhibition, because um, those because th where you put things in exhibition displays and permanent gallery displays really matters. Um, you know, if you've got a key object which fits your story, or you've got objects which are sensitive in certain ways, um, need to be treated in different ways. It's it's in, you know where you put them is very very important. Although in reality, that is sometimes a decision which is made. A couple of days before an exhibition opens. So I think unless you're unless you're working on a um, an exhibition which is highly designed, where you have a you know case layouts and mock-ups and things weeks months in advance, um, often that decision is kind of made sh you know close to the time. Um, I have worked on exhibitions where we've invited community members to come in and install with us. So um, they've helped us decide object positioning. Uh, we've even gotten to do things like painting, you know, and decide paint colours and lighting and stuff like that. Um, but it, 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 it does depend kind of, you know, how things, how things fit. And um, also because making exhibitions can be quite a visual thing. Sometimes uh, you have a conflict where, you know, uh, one group is, you know, certain group of people thinking objects should go in one place and you as a curator might think it goes somewhere else. Um, I wouldn't say you have the, you know, I mean, I've never been in an argument with people about where things go, but sometimes you're having to manage a, you know, lots of different expectations. Um, a couple of years ago, I worked on a faith gallery at Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery, um, and we were dealing with the major faiths, so we had to be careful that we gave each faith kind of equal weighting in the space although for example some of the buddhist objects were very very large and they sort of dominated the room when you walked in um, whereas some of the say Sikh objects were a bit smaller because those they're the things we had in the collection so um, I think it's, a, it's important to be open about that when you're working with communities um, and yeah in an ideal world I think if you know if it's safe to do so you would involve the people that you're co-curating with the kind of two three week installs um, because that's sometimes where the decisions get made because you can work on paper all you want but sometimes things don't quite look right when you put them in the space um, so you know with technology it's easier to share opinions with people and take a snap of something and say what do you think and then get feedback with that um, but you're having to juggle all these things when you're installing a exhibition or, or a permanent display thanks very much adam uh, and on this kind of uh, you know who chooses what's displayed or what history is told i'd just like to bring melissa in on that as well um, and maybe with your uh, research perspective as well as your um, museum yeah, I think, um, again, it probably depends on your museum, but for example, Museum of London, their permanent displays are supposed are built to have a, a life of 10 to 15 years. So, and also in a way, once someone's put something in a permanent display, if you then want to put it in a temporary display, it becomes quite complicated. So there are some things that you can, you can have in two places if you use facsimiles. Um, there are some things that you can move around, but there are some things that are, are quite delicate and moving them somewhere for three months and putting them back and then a year later taking them out and moving them again um, becomes quite complicated. I think there are also different kinds of objects. Um, for example, if you have um, printed materials or if you have textiles, a lot of the time, um, if you've got a permanent display that's supposed to be up for 15 years, you can't have the same dress in the same space for that amount of time. 
or the book open on the same page for that amount of time, for example. So there are kind of conservation decisions that influence what goes where um, and for how long. Um, and the, the decisions about permanent displays, um, they're kind of the backbone of the museum. So people will kind of use those to understand whatever else you put in your temporary displays. So though, kind of the decision about those, there'll be that initial decision, I guess, when the museum is open, then things will be updated as times change. People view history in different ways, for example, non-linear, and they start to think of it thematically, or they think for of it thematically, and then everyone's like, oh, I don't know where I am in history, make it a timeline again. So it, yeah, it, it really depends. And I think there's a lot of audience research that goes into that kind of work, certainly um, with how Museum of London are reimagining New Museum, last I heard of it, which is about a year ago, it was very much based on sort of what audiences um, would want and how they would want London's story to be told and, and using that as a starting point for the permanent galleries and then thinking of sort of the, the most kind of pertinent themes that they would use in the first few temporary exhibitions um, after opening. Um, so I think, so I have not given a very clear answer, but I think it's, it isn't very clear. Um, I guess anything in theory can go anywhere, but then there are numerous restrictions which prevent things going in certain places um, and, and moving around too much. And I think with temporary exhibitions as well, you're more able to bring in loan objects from uh, members of the public or from other collections, whereas obviously with permanent exhibitions, it's a lot harder to borrow something for a really, really long period of time. Um, so there's lots of ways to kind of bounce off your, your own collection in a temporary exhibition in ways that you wouldn't really be able to do in a permanent display um, by connecting it with what's out, uh, elsewhere, um, I'd say. Thanks so much, Melissa. Um, Holly, can I just bring you in on this kind of like choice and permanence and temporary? Because I know you work in a historic building as well, and I wondered how that informed the conservation decisions um, and so on. Um, yeah, so um, like Melissa said, there is that conservation um, aspect to consider. Um, fortunately, we have quite a robust uh, collection. There is a lot of, sort of industrial things within our collection. Um, you know, we're, we're not dealing with silks or ceramics as, as such, um, or not, not that much anyway. Um, so the, the conservational stuff comes into it um, to an extent, um, but a lot of it is space for us. You know, we, we have a very limited amount of space and it's very awkward. Um, it, it was never intended to be... Uh, a museum um, so you're working to the constraints of the space that you have uh, which is why we, we we tend to do a lot of, sort of Roman engagement um, and um, that sort of um, so we we have um, all sorts of ways of getting around that but it does definitely impact um, what we do and, and how we do it uh, and for us, keeping uh, environmental conditions stable is, is quite difficult. So um, we tend to, uh, when we've got our permanent galleries, we tend to sort of keep them to about five years, uh, if we can. In certain areas of the museum, it's less. So we've got original police cells. At the moment, we're working on a big project to refurb them. Um, and the, the consideration around that is obviously uh, a lot of environmental because it's it's very cold and, and um, relatively... Uh, high um, humidity down there so uh, that has to be a consideration uh, and again um, sort of in terms of community uh, we have a, a lot of community say about what goes on and how long it goes on for and we have quite a large collection a lot of people don't realize so in terms of rotating uh, we've got quite a good uh, record for, for um, stuff not necessarily staying in store for a long time um, and then we, we also have uh, vehicles which uh, we've got outreach fleet so they will often roam so um, we don't tend to keep things on display for long for um, conservational uh, reasons, space reasons, and uh, the community say so. Uh, so that's kind of how it, how it works at our place. Thanks so much, Holly. That's really uh, enlightening. Um, we're coming to kind of the end of the session, uh, very sadly, uh, but we've had one final um, question about decolonisation uh, and what's going on uh, in our organisations. Um, it's a big question uh, that we won't have time to properly address, but I wondered whether, uh, Stacey, you had any thoughts on that to maybe start closing our session off? Um, I'm not sure I can delve too much into it. I guess um, for us, 
our collections are very much centered to the uh, to the audiences that are collected at the time so you know they are very much white centralized and, and it was a massive issue uh, with us um but yeah without going into too much details I, I we're aware of time um i i realize i need to do a lot of learning and unlearning before i can kind of tackle that um topic but it is something i'm um trying to do within my organization and as a council museum it's definitely a high priority um for us so yeah i definitely need to start with myself before starting with the collection and i'm yeah very keen to to dismantle um some of the narratives that exist currently thanks so much stacy um that yeah dismantling narratives and dismantling uh, different working practices i think is something we're all coming together on um in the final kind of few minutes i'm going to ask each of the panelists um to ask uh, to answer what's the what's the kind of the one direction that you really want to see the sector uh, moving in uh, in the next uh, 20 years or so um, and I'm going to start uh, with Adam please. Gosh that's a that's a tough one um, well I think I mean on on the back of uh, decolonization I think it's it's so important for us to get our collections known to source communities where they come from so uh, that is doing a lot of um, background kind of, uh, you know, cataloguing objects, getting them photographed, doing research on their provenance because um, people need to know where things, uh, you know, what you have in your, your collection. And, and some museums are a lot further along the line um, than, than others. Um, but um, that kind of work can have, have a lot of benefits when a community say in Australia or in Papua New Guinea gets in touch with you and says what have you got from my community if you've got good photos if you've got good descriptions if you've got um, appropriate language used in the catalog entries that can really help you so that work you can do you can kind of get on with um, uh, laying the groundwork um, so that is very important and it, it goes back to accessibility you know collections which are accessible are accessible to the people in Leeds to people who pay my wages the communities in Leeds but they're also accessible to communities on the other side of the world and certainly if you've got a good catalogue entries photographs etc etc it means you can share that information uh, quickly um, so I, I think for me lockdown is quite a good opportunity to just kind of chip away at um, getting the collection more accessible by improving the catalogue entries so yeah it's not it's not an exciting answer but I think that's important for the next sort of hundred years you know we've got so many things that we need to you know look at in our stores and make and kind of publish and make accessible thanks Adam uh, absolutely documentation matters hashtag um, Holly, where would you like to see things move uh, in the next few years? Um, I would say obviously more diversity. I think that goes without saying really. Um, I often, you know, see this sort of same faces in curatorial meetings and uh, when I'm, I'm sitting down with um, other people networking and whatnot, you sort of see this, the same kind of people. So I'd like to see a bit more um, in the way of diversity. Um, and I'd like to see the sector um, and outside the sector and curators themselves champion their work more um, because you know, our sort of um, job role is changing so much so quickly that there is that sort of fear that eventually we're going to die out <laughs> because you know um, where we sit in terms of uh, sort of the curator of old versus the curator of new um, how how that plays into things um, and I think the only way that we can uh, sort of uh, show the importance of uh, the new curator and I suppose elements of the old curator is um, by having people shout out about what we do and have more transparency in it because uh, like we, when we started off this session so many people don't know what, what we do so mystical uh, and I'd like to sort of shed that that unicorn uh, element um, you know that transparency and, and championing because um, like Adam said a lot of, of the work that we need to do in relation to what he was talking about um, can only be improved um, and made easier if uh, people know uh, what we do um, and, and why we do it and why it's important I think I think that's essential thanks so much Holly uh, I think that's a really set 
great set of uh, things to add on. I'm just going to read out the list of um, uh, words to do with being a curator that we started with um, before thanking the panel. Uh, so accessible, collaborative, uh, conventional, research-led, community-focused, uh, creative, sustainable, uh, collaborative and uh, relevant. Um, I hope we've given you uh, some insight into what it means to be a curator uh, in museums at the moment um, and I hope you've all uh, learned something new um, and I really hope you will join me in thanking Holly and Stacey and Adam and Melissa uh, for their time and their thoughts and their expertise. Thank you so much, hopefully we'll see you at some more events uh, this week. Bye. Thank you.